Hello, and welcome everyone to this video entitled, How Can I Use IP in My DO254 Program? It's a common question. Um, I've put this video, a short video together based on a white paper I've written called Assuring Compliant and Cost-Effective Use of IP in DO254 Designs. Uh, my name is Michelle Lang, and I'll be talking through the slides over the next few minutes. Just as a basic introduction or overview, um, what we're seeing today is that the growing availability of silicon real estate, in other words, just the capacity of today's chips, um, enables more and more features in smaller and smaller devices. That's pretty obvious to anyone working in the electronics industry. Um, and a trend that just follows alongside of this and actually supports this is the use of intellectual property, which we'll be referring to, referring to as IP. So IP is very commonly, to, commonly used to create today's designs, and it's used to be able to create more features more quickly and typically more economically. Now, even the aerospace and defense markets are starting to use IP, but unfortunately there's, there's roadblocks to the use of IP, and this can mean a certification policy and simply business models that are creating these sorts of barriers. But we're also seeing new business models and new methods that are emerging that are basically um, making these barriers go away. So this is sort of an overview of what I'll be talking about over the few slides. Let's talk for a minute about the, the rising uh, usage of IP in today's designs and the factors that are driving this um, upward trend. First, as I already mentioned, uh, silicon real estate is abundant. So these you know, smaller geometries are providing um, more and more capabilities to add uh, complex functions in very small devices. So what's happening is more and more of these functions are being integrated such that we today we have systems. What used to be systems are now implemented on a chip for system on chip or SOC designs. And just because you can pull these functions together doesn't mean you can do it produ uh, productively, but the use of IP is a key in doing this. So IP blocks are reusable design components. They can be put together relatively quickly and provide a very productive environment for creating these system on a chip designs. Um, here's a quote that I lifted from the Design Reuse Paradox, an article um, by Numetrics. Uh, a little bit dated back in November 23rd, 2009, but it gives a, a, a good indication of the amount of IP, IP being used in today's designs. Uh, so if we look back in, in 2007, a third of all logic was reused design blocks. So a third of the content of devices in 2007 was IP or reuse. That's expected to rise to nearly 50% by 2015, according to the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors. And I would say that we're probably already there today. But let's look at the types of IP. There's, there's really three main types, two main types and kind of a hybrid, actually. So there's hard, hard IP. So hard IP is the most optimized and the least flexible form of IP. Basically, hard IP is either bound to silicon or actually physically implemented in silicon in a specific device. Then there's soft IP. Soft IP is the most flexible and the least optimized because it is not bound to a specific device or a specific platform. Instead, soft IP refers to um, getting the design code as source code, for example, VHDL, which can be used repeatedly and in you know, more than one device, more than one silicon platform. Then there's sort of a, a hybrid or you know, somewhere in the middle. Some people use the term firm IP to reflect um, basically soft IP that's uh, distributed in a netlist format as opposed to source. Now the aerospace and defense markets um, today are beginning to use IP. In general these industries are naturally more cautious and they tend not to adopt the latest technologies but, but for very good reason. It's because they have more safety certification, reliability, um, and standards considerations that they have to take into account. Um, and these things aren't easily addressed with the use of IP. And yet what we're seeing is, you know, there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of pressure to utilize the technology that's out there. So system on chip designs and the IP usage methodology, which is really the base, you know, the, the way that people get these system on chip designs, 
is really be beginning to permeate even even this market, which is typically considered to be you know to lag the general consumer electronics market by by many years. The pressure to do this uh, to move to these design styles is coming from um, more features, you know, more functionality uh, in a single device, in a single system, and more competition, whether that's competition from abroad or or more competition even here at home. Um, the, and pressures to reduce the size, weight, and power, sometimes that's referred to as swap, of, of all of these systems. Uh, more integration, which is basically the result of, of meeting the issue of reduced size, weight, and power. More integration means that, that these companies have to be developing SOC designs. And SOC designs, of course, are based on an IP usage methodology. Let's look at DO254 policy and IP. What does DO254 say about IP? Um, IP policy is murky in the best case and kind of lacking uh, in the worst case. And what I mean by that is DO254 itself, while it mentions COTS or commercial off-the-shelf um, components, it doesn't mention IP at all. You have to remember, though, when DO254 was um, written, that was back in the 90s, published in the year 2000, and, and system on chip design and IP was just not a prevalent phenomenon, especially in aerospace back then. The later documents do, however, introduce this notion of IP. Order 8110.105 and the more recent uh, EASA software and CEH memo introduced the term COTS IP. So previously, the term COTS had referred to, you know, um, commercial off-the-shelf components, you know, whole components that were sold that were part of these uh, airborne systems. But what we're seeing more today is that there's um, commercial off-the-shelf IP blocks, small reusable IP blocks that are be being incorporated into a user's custom logic and being then subject to DO254 compliance. So what is it that these two more recent documents have to say about COTS IP. Let's look at order 8110.105 first. Now, I'm just lifting a small excerpt that's kind of representative of the text of this section. Um, there, there's much more in there you should probably read yourself, but here's the, the what I think is the most pertinent uh, statements. Availability of COTS IP doesn't automatically guarantee that it can be used in a manner that complies with airworthiness requirements, regulations, policy, and guidance. Well, that's a pretty strong statement. Uh, it goes on to say a little bit later, using a COTS IP in an SCH, that's simple electronic hardware or complex electronic hardware, that's installed in airborne systems or equipment should satisfy applicable functional and safety related requirements. Okay, now let's look at the EASA software and CEH memo that just came out in 2012. This is the most recent of the documents. It, it pretty much mirrors uh, what Order 8110.105 says, it states it a little bit differently. It says, the rigor of the development processes for any COTS IP used in the design and implementation of ASICs or PLDs should be commensurate with their intended use and should satisfy the applicable function and safety requirements. I mean, it goes on to say more, but that's that's the gist of it. What, what these two documents are saying, in other words, is don't use IP unless you can demonstrate compliance. Now, of course, the best way to demonstrate compliance would be to actually have DO254 compliant IP. Why don't we have that? Um, well, showing compliance, especially for DAL A and B designs, typically requires, or it certainly would require for DAL A and B, getting access to the source of that IP. The issue here is that most IP vendors don't provide their source. In other words, if they provided their source, that would uh, basically annihilate their business. So protecting their source protects their livelihood. This image I have here on the right basically shows this. You have your IP vendor on the left. They have their design environment and their processes and their intellectual property source. That's all considered proprietary. So there's this wall they put up between themselves and their end users, their customers, to not reveal any of that. What they provide is a black box model and some documentation that says, here's what this IP does. 
And in a normal business environment, the IP integrator, that, that's enough for them. They take the black box model, they incorporate it into their design, they read the documentation so they know what it's supposed to do, and they're fine with that. Unfortunately, this model simply doesn't work in a DO254 compliant environment. Um, an IP integrator in this situation would have to somehow figure out how to reverse engineer the IP to prove that it's compliant, um, which is almost impossible and really frowned upon in, a, in terms of an IP typical business relationship, um, or otherwise re-engineer their design, their system, to put in additional mitigations to satisfy compliance. And to do all of that additional work really kind of eliminates or dissolves the productivity gains of using the IP in the first place. At some point you say, you know what, I'm just going to design it myself. Now, most IP vendors, I mean, this is another complicating factor. Most IP vendors don't know about DO254. They certainly don't have IP or they don't have DO254 experience in-house, which takes a long time to build up. Um, and also what we find is that the, the aerospace market, because it's such a small niche and the quantities are so low, it doesn't have a lot of pull. So it's not like the, you know, a customer can say, you know, we're going to buy millions of parts. We need you to do this for us. It's more like hundreds of parts, which doesn't have the same kind of um, ROI for an IP vendor to do anything special like develop DO254 compliant versions of the IP. Now, to overcome these barriers, um, there are some new methods out there that are being developed. In fact, the one that I'd like to talk about is the solution that our company um, does. I work for the company called Logicircuit. We are a DO254 expert company. We do consulting design work, um, and that's all we do. We focus on the design of DO254 compliant um, programs. So we would consider ourselves a third-party expert consulting company. And so if you take a third-party consulting company, an expert in DO254, and pair them with the IP uh, vendor to provide compliant versions, this solves a lot of the problem. Now, how do we do this? Uh, we basically, instead of having a brick wall between the IP vendor and the IP integrator, we insert ourselves um, as an enabler as opposed to a wall. Um, we work with the IP vendor under NDA to get access to their source, and we take that source through a full DO254 DAL A compliant process. Now, through this process, of course, the source is being reviewed, it's being verified um, at, at the white box level, and it's also subject to audit. So, under NDA, we are allowed to um, show the source under this uh, agreement only under uh, certification requirements. At the end of the process, we uh, provide an encrypted source file and all of the artifacts that show the process that we went through that demonstrate the DAL-A compliance. And this whole package, the certification data package, is what we provide the IP integrator who can then use the black box model along with the certification artifacts incorporate that into their design and be able to demonstrate that the design assurance aspects of it, the airworthiness aspects to the certification authorities so that it can be used in aircraft design. We consider this a win-win-win situation. The IP vendors maintain their business model, maintain their source. Logicircuit uses their expertise and provides or enables the IP integrator to have a cost-effective method for using this IP in a very um, safe and efficient manner for aircraft design. So how do you learn more about this? How do you learn more about IP in general and the policy and your options? Because this isn't your only option. This is one that I would like to present to you, though. What I'd suggest is reading those pertinent policy documents. Read what's in DO254. Read how it talks about COTS IP. Then look at Order 8110-105. Read what it has to say. And also look at the EASA policy memo, even if you're in the U.S., because um, the EASA memo is the most recent, and I believe that the FAA will probably be coming out with something that um, aligns with that in, in other regards um, pretty shortly. Do your homework on the use of IP. Remember that warning um, from the policy. Don't just use it because it's available. Uh, so if you are considering the use of IP, make sure you have a strategy 
for how you're going to show compliance before you opt to use it in your design. Very, very important. Um, to learn more about what Logic Circuit can offer, um, visit LogicCircuit.com. Uh, again, just download the white paper, Assuring Compliant and Cost-Effective Use of IP in DO254 Designs from the resources area on this site. Uh, this video presentation was a very short version of the content that's presented in that um, white paper. And uh, while you're there on our site, you can examine our catalog of 40-plus uh, DALA compliant IP cores. If you have any questions about this, feel free to contact me. My name is Michelle Lang. You I can be reached at Michelle underscore Lang at LogiCircuit.com. Thank you.